Welcome to the Contrarian Investor Podcast. We give voice to those who challenge a prevailing sentiment in global financial markets. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests were not compensated for their appearance, nor do they supply payment in order to appear. Individuals on this podcast may hold positions in the securities that are discussed. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. This podcast episode may have ads and the occasional announcement. To listen without ads or announcements and take advantage of a host of other benefits, consider becoming a premium subscriber. Visit the website contrarian.supercast.tech. That's T E C H for more information. Now, here's your host, Mr. Nathaniel E. Baker. I'm here with Cormac Kinney of Diamond Standard. And Cormac, your company's vision is I'm quoting from the website establishing diamonds as a liquid hard asset. I'm interested, and I'm sure listeners are as well, with why diamonds have not become an investable asset class like gold, platinum, silver, name your precious metal, or a million other things that are investable. You can invest in orange juice futures if you want. You can't really invest in diamonds, or can you? You could, but it was painful. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, diamonds were, were left behind. And if, it's an interesting statistic. If you look at all the precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, even rhodium, investors own at least 15% of the global supply. That means that 15% of all the world's rhodium is in a bar on a shelf in a vault owned by a family office or part of an ETF or underlying a futures contract. But in the case of diamonds, you could never do that. An investor could never hold diamonds because there was always this lack of transparency. And it's because every diamond is a little bit different. An investor never knows what they're really worth. Mm -hmm. And according to accounting standards, if you can't mark to market, the value of an investment, a lot of investors can't hold it, like a pension or an endowment or any kind of ETF. If you can't trade it on a national market, an ETF just can't hold it. It's, it's, it's a very simple rule. So diamonds were left behind because of that. And the only option really for people where they could invest in a giant blue diamond or a, you know go to Sotheby's and bid on a on a yellow diamond necklace that's you know 20, 22 carats, it might be five or seven million bucks. And so a lot of uh, family offices have historically invested in, in gems in general through these auction markets. And the problem with that is the fees are outrageous, not outrageous, but they're, they're expensive. You know, Sotheby's charges 20% coming and going. And so the friction, as a trader would call it, of, of trading a, a, a diamond historically was just impossible to overcome. And even if one diamond was auctioned at Sotheby's, a pink diamond, that doesn't tell you re reliably the value of every other diamond. And really what attracted me to this space is that you know, my background is, is computer science hmm. and trading systems. And I realized that this was a computer science problem of how can you overcome that differentiation of all the different types of diamonds hmm. and turn it into an investment asset. And that's exactly our goal. And, and, we, and we have accomplished it actually. Okay, and I want to talk about that in a little bit, but let's first talk a little more about the, the fundamentals of diamonds. And now obviously these are used in jewelry. Anybody who's ever bought an engagement ring will, will know all about this, the clarity cut I and mean, whatever the third C is color. Yeah, color, yeah. Yeah. And yes, and, and you touched on some of this stuff about how every stone is, is different. Do these things retain their value over time? And are there other uses other than in jewelry? Well, yeah. So diamonds are, you know, require significant expenditure to discover 
extract, cut and polish, and also to distribute. Hmm. And, and so that's economic substance. Um, and what's interesting about diamonds that a lot of people don't realize is they haven't discovered a new diamond mine in over 20 years. Hmm. And so the supply of diamonds is absolutely running out. And it, the production has gone down by three to 5% per year hmm. because several of the major mines have been completely depleted. And it used to be about 10 or 12% of diamonds were mined in Australia. The last mine in Australia closed two years ago. So there's no more diamonds coming out of Australia. So it's a diminishing asset. It takes a tremendous expenditure to extract diamonds. The only new diamonds they found are diamonds that washed out to sea, basically, mm -hmm. over millions of years when uh, underground rivers will go through uh, extinct volcanoes and kind of carve out diamonds. So as a... As a uh, mineral you know it holds its value and it and it's and it's the replacement cost is very very significant however what people have always experienced is if they buy a diamond at a retail store and they try to sell it back they they're basically giving back all the retail markup and they're and they're selling it closer to its cost its marginal cost and you know that's a that's an issue with a lot of assets but it's very particular with diamonds because they're generally sold at retail mm. and so one big uh hurdle for diamond standard was to eliminate all entirely the retail markup and and we do that as a market maker we buy diamonds through bidding and we charge a 3.5 percent fee and and package them as as a commodity so when you go to sell a diamond standard commodity you're not giving back all that retail markup and historically people have been able to sell their commodities within one percent hmm. of of the price they paid versus hmm. paying a 20 percent spread for an auction so we think it's been very important to create that liquidity and remove the friction and how do you do that? Because a lot of this depends on the grade of the diamonds, right? So do you have like a, a basket that's like grade, whatever, or yeah, how does that work? Yeah. So, so that was always a challenge. Every diamond was different. And we uh, discovered, uh, and we've gotten received multiple patents. Uh, we discovered a very transparent and fair process to create a fungible commodity. And we shamelessly copied the gold market. And with gold, you have a, a 400 ounce bar that's what's called good for delivery to trade on the futures market, for example. It's used to settle a futures contract. And so our challenge was how do we create a, a good for delivery bar for diamonds? And we did exactly that. It's literally a bar, and you know, that it's a plastic bar with diamonds inside. And the breakthrough is that every bar is equivalent. What makes these equivalent is that there's a, a, a group of eight to nine diamonds that are optimized mathematically. What that means is that the carat weights of the, of the group always add up to a public standard. The carat weight, the color, the clarity, it's a factor model that where our optimizer forces every bar to be equal for hmm. all those factors and if every bar is equal even if we make them uh 25 years apart they must contain the same mix of diamonds but because they're equal they all trade at the same price and so these bars are good for delivery to settle cftc futures and options and what was the price the original price i guess on those things and what is it now so the price right now is about uh, four thousand for for a bar is forty seven thousand four hundred, I believe. Mm -hmm. I don't know the price. We don't set the price. People are surprised. Uh -huh. I have to look it up on Bloomberg because that's where that's the official index where the trading is reported. So it's just like gold. The market tells us the price every day. Our job 
is to make the bars the exactly exactly the same forever. And we have a pretty interesting process in how we do that. Talk about the price of diamonds over time. Yeah. For the first time, we have an index, and it's D D I A M index. If you look it up on Bloomberg or Reuters or Refinitiv or S and P, you can look it up on the on the professional data sites. Uh, but the diamond prices actually have gone up about thirteen percent in the last three years. But in that, they all they had a big spike during COVID, and they kind of came back down to earth in 2023. So during COVID, when a lot of the diamond mines were shut down, hmm. and a lot of consumers were home buying diamonds, buying jewelry, diamonds went up about 40% mm -hmm. uh, in, in 2021 and 2022. But longer term, they've been more slowly going up. Like I said, about thirteen percent the last three years. Mm -hmm. And are there uses for this other than jewelry, or is that basically it? Well, diamonds historically have been used for industrial applications, uh, like cutting and grinding. And what they would do is they would sweep up the scraps and and put them onto a drill bit, for example. And they still do that, but they can also that's a good application of lab grown diamonds. So a lab grown diamond is grown in a lab with high pressure and temperature. And it's chemically carbon, so it, it's chemically a diamond, but it, it doesn't take the economic substance to create. And, and fortunately, uh, a gem lab can instantly detect when a, when a diamond is synthetic. So synthetic diamonds have fallen in value by about 80% in the last three years, so that they're roughly 3 to 4% of the value of an equivalent natural diamond, but they're actually useful for some, for cutting and grinding because they can just grow tiny diamonds consistently, put them on a drill bit and use them. Okay. For our commodities, what people find interesting, you know, we, use, we, have, we have to use every size of, of uh, diamond. And these are basically all the diamonds you'll find in a jewelry store from, you know, small, medium and large, Good, bad, and ugly, I like to say, but all the different colors, clarities, carat weights are, you know, incorporated into a bar or coin. And so we use about 94% of all the gem quality diamond types. How, and, uh, the, and so you said $47,000 is in one of those little bars that you held up? Yeah, it's about the, half the size of a candy bar. Wow, that seems like a pretty efficient way to do a whole bunch of things uh, yeah. yeah and yeah. it's no metal uh yeah. and it's not a monetary equivalent you can bring this anywhere in the world hmm. and um you know about uh about six percent of our clients actually take delivery at home because yeah. yeah. we'll sh you know you own this we'll ship it to you wherever you want it but 94 94 five percent uh keep them at brinks right so we we actually built a uh, diamond vault with Brinks in Delaware. And that turned out to be very important because there's no sales tax in Delaware. Uh -huh. And so for our investors, when they buy a commodity, if they keep it in Delaware, there's no sales tax. Mm -hmm. If we ship it, if we ship it to you in New York or California, you're paying some sales tax. Could somebody break open the, those little bars and sell the diamonds individually? And would you get an arbitrage there ostensibly? You'll, you'll lose money. Oh, so you will. Okay. We absolutely built it so you can extract the diamonds. All you do is drop the bar in paint thinner. Uh -huh. And in six hours, the bar melts. Uh -huh. It was designed for that. And every diamond in, in every commodity comes with a GIA certificate. They're, they're, in fact, they're double inspected by two gem labs. The whole thing is we're regulated and supervised and audited by Deloitte. But uh, you could easily melt the bar and make a bracelet. Uh, you know, you can imagine that bracelet, though, will have small, medium, large diamonds, a, a variety of D, E, G, K color. So it won't be a consistent piece of jewelry like you would find at Tiffany's. Um, and this, you, would, you would inherit the problem that, that diamond investors have always had. Now you have to sell eight loose diamonds and you're not going to get a fair price. 
if you sell the commodity, you sell it at the at the market spot. And maybe you take a 1% haircut. But if you try to sell, you know, loose diamonds on 47th Street, you know, Shlomo and David, they're, they're going to lowball you yep. and say, oh, I, you know, you know, you're not going to get good money. So you might lose 15%. But because we're basically packaged to them, selling them at wholesale, you'll, you'll do okay, way better than if you bought them from a retail jewelry store. Sick of me yet? Become a premium subscriber and avoid all ads or interruptions. Other benefits as well. Visit Contrarian dot supercast dot tech for more information do you have any i, I know you said the, the the index is only a couple years old do you have any idea historically n- not so much how how diamonds have performed but more like what they're how they have done versus as a proxy to i don't know call it gold call it stocks any risk asset like you mentioned yeah. the, the covid phenomenon um and what led to the the demand there uh, yeah. yeah. How otherwise has it has it held up? Do you have any information on that? Yeah, a lot. So actually, we have a 20 year history of our index. And the way we were able to create that is when we launched the commodity. We did not decide how much of each diamond goes in a bar. It was actually accomplished through a market making process. And we had to buy a, a, a statistical sample of all diamonds. And we had to spend the same amount of money for every category. And so you can imagine a a D flawless category, if we're only spending uh, $22,000, we might only get four D flawless diamonds. But for the same $22,000, we might get 500 small, you know, quarter carat KSI2 diamonds. So that gave us a yield. And it's a a literal yield curve for diamonds. How much diamond per dollar did you get at that point in time? Mm -hmm. And that established the standard. So forever, we have to buy the same exact frequency of all the characteristics. So we don't spend the same amount of money in every category, but we have to end up with the same total yield to match the yield curve. So once we had that yield curve, we were able to buy wholesale data for diamonds going back 20 years and multiply them by all those weights and back test what would the price have been. What's interesting about wholesale diamond data is that they're all liars. <laughs> if Because there you do a survey of, hey, what are diamonds going for? They always overstate it by about 30%. Mm-hmm. But what we did is we eliminated that because we only took the the percentage delta per day okay and so they we basically assumed they lie relatively consistently over time and be, with that data we were able to back test and create a 20 year history now to answer your question we first thing we looked at is is the performance versus gold and silver and stocks and diamonds have been extremely flat so in the last 20 years say you know starting in 2020 2002 2002 2002, gold went up over uh 7x 5x uh during that period it came down a bit and silver went up about 5x during that time both of them outperforming the s p very very significantly diamonds were relatively flat they returned nearly zero maybe uh uh, you know, 20% versus 400, 500%. Um, recently, though, diamonds have started to outperform. In fact, until at the end of 2022, 20, diamonds outperformed the S&P by quite a bit. Hmm. But what we were interested to look at were periods of financial crisis. Hmm. 2008 and, um, you know, the, the, the last five major crises, diamonds outperformed gold by about 20% on average, gold being, you know, uh, the safety, you know, uh, you know, a a hedge asset against financial crises, gold obviously performed dramatically better than stocks, but diamonds really dramatically better than gold in crises. 
So it's interesting as an institutional yeah. investor, it's a, you know, my background, I think, you know, is, you know, I was a trader, a yeah. PM at, for Paul Tudor Jones. You know, you want to have this kind of a diversifier, a hedge uh, in a portfolio. Hmm. Any idea why that is, why it uh, performed in 08? Is it just because of the, you know, I guess, elast inelastic demand for these jewelry items, maybe? And... Well, liquidity correlates all financial assets. Mm. So when you have, uh, you know, people running for cash, mm. they're selling stocks, bonds, and gold. Sure. Um, and, and we saw it in, you know, I was a quant PM in, in, in 2008. And all the models failed because of a liquidity crisis. And diamonds were not exposed to that liquidity because people basically couldn't sell their diamonds for, you know, a good market value. So they just hold on to them. Hmm. And so historically, diamonds have a 3.8% volatility, which is half of, of other precious metals even. So extraordinary low volatility. And I, I've never seen it in my career, but extru, you know, z nearly zero correlation to gold, silver, platinum. Hmm. So it's pure, met, you know, precious metals. Zero point zero five correlation, zero point zero correlation to stocks and bonds. Hmm. So I don't know of any other asset that has that, but I don't think it'll last. I was going to say, isn't that, your solution kind of going to throw a wrench in that? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we we recently got approval to list futures contracts hmm. th that are CFTC, uh, you know, regulated. Uh, that's through the MJEX, and they'll be quoted on the on the CME, Globex. That's going to introduce leverage to yeah. and and uh, and that will lead to volatility, but that'll also lead to liquidity mm -hmm. and uh, shrink the the spreads. Mm we think even further. So that'll benefit investors by having liquidity. And I think once you have a diamond ETF, which we think we, we've actually filed an ETF mm. uh, on the New York, with the New York Stock Exchange, I think it takes two years to get approved. Mm. Um, but once we have an ETF, then it becomes part of the asset allocation mix. And, uh, and then diamonds, I think will become over time more correlated Mm -hmm. uh, and and more volatile. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on what might lead to a rise in diamond prices? Like you mentioned, the COVID, you know, and it's based on fundamentals, right? Like the second, you know, yeah. this, you know, people ordering diamonds to make jewelry and sell it on Etsy. Uh, is there anything else you can see that that might cause something similar? Yeah. Well, there's a very interesting. You know, I'm a fundamentalist in many ways. So I mentioned already that there's no new diamond mines discovered in 25 years, that the production is diminishing mm. by about uh, three to five percent per year. At the same time, the demand for natural diamonds has been rising uh, by four to nine percent mm. per year, according to projections. And that demand is a lot of it coming from Asia right. as uh, uh, Chinese consumers, especially as they start uh, you know, demanding luxury goods, that's been a big driver, but also in the United States, uh, demand for diamond jewelry has been growing fairly consistently. Um, and so you have a mismatch, you have, you have falling supply, increasing demand. And I think that's why we see a baseline uh, price appreciation of 20% per year Mm -hmm. Lately, it's fallen because of there was an overproduction after COVID, and and then the Chinese consumer actually slowed down quite a bit uh, this year. So diamond prices have fallen. Uh, there's also a seasonality to diamond prices. Okay. You know, before they, you know they kind of rise in September towards the holiday season, mm -hmm. and then there's a, a spike kind of towards Valentine's Day and at New Year's as well. Um, so right now we're at the historical low price correlation wise, but the main driver is going to change. And that's what I think is the key opportunity for investors. You know, as I mentioned, investors own 15% of rhodium. They own 19% of silver and 17% of platinum. 
they own about 1.5% of diamonds. Mm -hmm. So we believe that having positioned diamonds as a uh, market traded asset that's CFTC approved good for delivery or approved for CFTC security uh, features, I should say. We believe that as once we have vehicles like futures and options and ETFs, investors, especially institutional investors, will start allocating in a larger way. And we think diamonds catch up with, with palladium. Mm, mm. And that 15% will get acquired by investors. And by the way, 15% of diamonds, that's 12 years of supply. Wow. So we would have to buy 100% of every diamond that comes out of the earth for 12 years to supply what we think is the pent up investor demand. And a very similar scenario happened with uranium wow. about two years ago. There were two the world's first listed uranium funds that got launched, one by Sproton and one by Yellowcake in the UK. And within the first nine months, uranium was up 70%. Mm. It just strictly because of that investor demand. Mm -hmm. And how close are we to getting futures contracts on diamonds? I think within six months. Really? Okay. Yeah, we already we already have the approval. We already have a signed agreement. We're we're also a soon to announce a listed spot venue, and um, and that'll help the futures. So there'll be futures options and spot which are, you know, that's what's called a national market price yeah. in uh, securities terms. And, and that will unlock a lot of liquidity. And in like early 2024, uh, we're looking at with uh, the date of today's recording. Wow, that's yeah. really interesting. All right, uh, Cormac Kinney, fascinating conversation here about diamonds. I want to take a short break, come back, ask you some more stuff about yourself, about your venture. And we'll do that, but let's first have a quick break. If you are a premium subscriber, do not touch the dial. You will not get a break. We'll be right back. In fact, we already are. And everybody else to become a premium subscriber, visit the website contrarianpod.substack.com and sign up. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the Contrarian Investor Podcast where we give voice to those who challenge a prevailing narrative in global financial markets. Consider becoming a premium subscriber. For $9 a month or less, premium subscribers receive a number of benefits. Podcasts are posted immediately after they're recorded. Transcripts are made available within 24 hours. Premium subscribers get direct access to the host. And of course, there are no ads or interruptions. Visit contrarian.supercast tech for more information. By the way, you don't need the dot tech suffix to get to that website. Dot com will do the trick. And we also have a Substack that you can where you can sign up for the same prices, same benefits, same details, contrarianpod.substack.com. So if you already have a Substack account and use it or have the app and use that, that's probably the best way to go. So contrarian.supercast.com or contrarianpod.substack.com, whole bunch of benefits, including, of course, getting this episode up to a week early without ads or annoying announcements. And you also get the daily contrarian briefing and podcast that is released every market day morning at 7 a.m. This is a contrarian take on the events of the day ahead and what is likely to move markets, such as economic data releases, earnings, and other things. It is really good, and that is completely unbiased, of course. So check that out, contrarianpod.substack.com or contrarian.supercast.tech. Now on with the show. Welcome back, everybody, here with Cormac Kinney of Diamond Standard in New York. Cormac, this is the segment of the show where we ask our guests to tell listeners a little bit more about themselves, about how they got involved in this line of work. You touched on it before. You were at a hedge fund. Uh, you start, I don't know if you started your career there, but yeah, take, take us back. Tell us about how you got interested in investing in the first place 
how this all took you to diamonds and to start Diamond Standard. Yeah, it was it was really kind of by accident um, that I ended up being the founder of Diamond Standard. Um, and it started at, at university. I studied computer science at Carnegie Mellon, and I ended up with three degrees. And starting at university, I, I founded my first software company. And I actually started three software companies while I was a student at Carnegie Mellon. Wow. And incredibly, all three of them got acquired by public companies. Hmm. They weren't huge, but they were some good new idea that was was you know useful to a to a larger organization. But the last company, which I actually ran for ten years, was called NeoVision, and we designed and built trading systems. Hmm. And we had a couple of good breakthroughs, like heat maps. A lot of people are familiar with. I actually invented heat maps wow. in the nineties. And I designed about 100 trading systems for the buy side and sell side and some of the exchanges. And ultimately, that company got acquired by the Carlisle Group. And after that, I spent so much time on trading floors. You know, the grass is always greener on the other side. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, I want to be a trader. That seems so wonderful. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. um, and, and I ended up building my own trading system. And I pioneered a, a, a new uh, technique called sentiment, which is basically I taught to computers how to read the news and uh -huh. decide if it was good or bad for the stock. And I was one of the pioneers of that in, in the early 2000s. But just based on that system, I ended up leveraging that into a role where I ran quantitative equities for Paul Tudor Jones, hmm. which is you know, a very famous... Sure. Mostly commodities investor. He, he, he called the 87 crash, yeah. um, but a very reputable, large right. hedge fund. And I ran that through 2008, um, and which was a very difficult time hmm. for trading with short sale restrictions. You couldn't, you couldn't go short. Lots of Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Um, but I did quite well because I was running something, you know, really unique and ended up, uh, then getting invited to run a much larger team at Millennium, mm. which is now, I think, a $60 billion fund here in, in New York. So I did that for a while. I ended up selling all of my IP to, to Millennium and um, going back to starting companies, which is what I, I really like to do. I actually didn't like being a trader that much. Mm. I like the, the grass build. is not always greener. No, <laughs> but it was fun building the trading system that sure. I enjoyed. Once they're built, you're just like looking at exception reports and and how do mm. we, you know, execution and it was no fun. Um, and my wife is a diamond dealer and a jewelry designer, and so for 20 years I learned accidentally I learned a lot about diamonds just from being exposed to her business. And what really intrigued me was that diamonds are a 1.2 trillion dollar asset class 1.2 trillion is actually more than silver platinum palladium rhodium all combined hmm. and i knew you know from working with hundreds of banks none of them owned any diamonds and um but they all had gold or silver or platinum and so i realized that the challenge was a computer science problem hmm. that uh that I could use all the techniques that I'd focused on, like mark automated market making and optimization, factor models, and statistical arbitrage. All of those techniques that I used for trading systems for 20 years, those were the ingredients to unlock diamonds as a, uh, as a fungible asset. And uh, I've spent now the last seven years really researching it and, and developing Diamond Standard. And we only launched our actual sales in uh, in late 2021. Mm. Uh, wow. Okay, that's really interesting. And there's a whole crypto element to this, right? From what I recall, I remember visiting you guys there. It's, it there's a blockchain. A blockchain. blockchain yes, element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely that's just not the crypto. Database. Yeah. Because right. I, if you call this crypto, I throw it at you. Fine. And yeah. it, good thing you can't throw that through the through the Zoom. <laughs> yeah. But it will it will leave a mark if I hit you, and and then I say, do you still think it's crypto? And you'll rub your head no, 
it's not. <laughs> All right. But but we do use blockchain. You're exactly right. Right. It's actually pretty cool. It, if you look at our bars from the side, you'll see that there's a white layer inside, and you can see it from the back because it's a it's a like a, oh, is, yeah. like a credit card built into the to the block. That's actually a wireless computer chip, wow. and it has an antenna around the whole edge, and that chip uh, stores all the information about all the diamonds. It has all the certificates. It has all the like audit approval, all the proof that bar A is the is equivalent to bar B. But that chip, we wanted to we our, our challenge is that when we make the commodity, you need all that information in order to be uh, assured that it's authentic. Mm. So the certificates need to travel with the commodity, but they also need to be public. So what we did is we publish all of the data on the blockchain, on a public blockchain that goes along with every bar. And that blockchain address is actually programmed into the commodity. So the chip is literally a blockchain node. Mm. It's part of the blockchain. And the benefit of that is that when this bar is delivered to a vault like the Brinks vault in Delaware, the owner, if you own it, you get a token. That token is a is a regulator approved vault receipt. We have the world's only regulatory license to issue commodity tokens. And it's because of our regulatory oversight, our audits by Deloitte, these tokens are approved to settle the futures contracts. They're approved to settle all the trading. So when you own the bar, all you do is you trade that token. Mm -hmm. And whoever owns the token, they own the bar and they can take delivery at any time. Mm. So it's a huge breakthrough. It's what's called a smart commodity because mm -hmm. it, and it's and it's blockchain native because mm -hmm. the bar itself is programmed with the blockchain and it can never be faked. Very cool. Yeah. I'm wondering, have you thought about at all about other asset classes and maybe using the same technique to kind of make those liquid as well? Um, you know, there's so yeah. many different things that, you know, like, like leather, I don't know. But yeah, that yeah. Kind of, yeah. Uh, you, you're, you're, you're onto something. So our technology, and like I said, now we have about seven or eight patents, is all about how do you take a a commodity that's slightly different and and turn that into a singular fungible commodity. And if you look at the world of commodities, you have a lot of things that are either too, too unique or too rare to trade with much liquidity. And you can think of rare earth metals. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of things like carbon credits, mm -hmm. which are very similar, but they're all a little bit different. And it's hard to trade something where there's only, you know, ten million dollars of depth. So what we're looking at is how do we aggregate carbon credits synthetically, kind of like mortgages, but real estate in general is another application where we mm. can we can create a synthetic uh, fungible unit that might rep represent commercial property in a region mm. or an entire city, and um, Obviously, you know, there's other hard commodities like emeralds and, and sapphires, sure. but also things like lumber or um, where there's lots of different grades and it's hard to invest in lumber except by going out and buying a truck full. But yeah, we're definitely looking at other applications and we're approached pretty regularly to, to license our technology. Although you wouldn't be able to pack different real estate into one of those little bars. That have to Not into a else. bar. <laughs> but you could synthetically bring together a bunch of oh yeah uh credit you know loans mm -hmm. against mortgages and use that as a synthetic investment in a region yeah i mean that'll basically just be like mbs on a larger scale wouldn't it um kind yeah. of but it's um what we do is automated market making at the individual level and statistical sampling that's entirely automated and consistent and okay. so MBS is, you know, some analyst putting together a bunch yeah. and 
you have a b tranche yeah uh that's a little more we we've we've refined that to a statistical art where it's entirely automated and regulator approved ah. so that's what's that's what's special wow that's really interesting why is it going back to diamonds real quick why haven't they discovered any new mines is it just there's they've no... looked yeah so a diamond mine is basically starts as a volcano yeah. and it has a, a a unique scenario where the volcano kind of is active and then it subsides and it goes to the right depth in the earth where it gets super compressed and then through plate tectonics it gets high enough again that you're able to get to it and so that happens extremely rarely on earth and there's little clusters like near the arctic um in russia and canada in in south africa botswana um there's really no significant diamond mines on in the entire continent of uh south america hmm. there's very minimal in north america so it's just the luck of the draw where they find these things and um you know just th they've looked intensely around the world and they haven't found any what they do find as i mentioned earlier you know these things are around for millions of years the tectonics move and and they'll be under under uh they'll be underground rivers that will flow through and so they'll find diamonds like in a river and they we won't they won't know where they came from mm -hmm. up upstream necessarily so the biggest investment lately De Beers has built, I think, five of these very large ocean ships that scrape the bottom of the ocean off of Africa, and they find these nodules, and it's basically over, over tens of thousands of years, there'll be a, a diamond, and it'll build magnesium around it. It's attracted to it. And so they're digging up these nodules, cracking them open, and they're finding yeah. di di diamonds. That doesn't sound like a very efficient process, though. No, it's very expensive, yeah. <clears throat> but it's the only new source they could find. Mm -hmm. The last, the last discovery was Canada, far mm -hmm. northern Canada, in uh, in I think around two thousand. Hmm. All right, very interesting. Cormac Kinney, thank you so much for joining the Contrarian Investor Podcast today. In closing, let's talk about how we would find out more about this. I mentioned your website, Diamond Standard dot co how do we find out more about you more about the firm and yeah get in touch if we want there's a lot of information there mm -hmm. um you know there's a lot of coverage like the financial times wall street journal bloomberg cnbc have all covered this mm -hmm. extensively and we're launching right now in fact i think today a, an institutional section that's where we're seeing the most demand is from institutional investors so we have a lot of research, a lot of statistics, the correlations are all now being published at diamondstandard.co slash institutional. But right now, anybody can buy this commodity. You don't need to be accredited. The market price of a coin is about 4740 So we think the price is actually, uh, because of the seasonality, we think it's near low. And uh, we think as the futures and options get approved and launched, we think that is the there's a potential, as we saw with uranium or gold, that you see a, a three, four, five x um, increase in price. Oh, for, okay, forty four hundred. We I quoted you as forty four thousand earlier. There's a there's a coin and a bar. Oh, I see. The bars are ten x. Ah. Uh, market price of the coin. Okay, because I did ask you about the bar, so that makes sense. So yeah. The bars are 44K and the coins. And again, unfortunately, not everybody's going to have access to the video, but it's like a little disc shaped thing. The exact um, same size as the mm -hmm. uh, as a Liberty Gold coin. Cool. Very cool. Not not by accident. Got it. Yeah, yeah. He's holding this up now. Nice. Right. However, a little deeper than Liberty Coin, just because also oh, yeah. you can fit all the diamonds in there. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Are you active on social media at all? Not so much. Uh, mostly LinkedIn. We'll publish okay. a lot of our content on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not really, uh, yeah, right now, we're only temporarily even offering to 
uh, consumers. Okay. Right. Most of our clients are family offices, hedge funds, now institutional. And we just signed a distribution deal through a bullion dealer. And pretty soon you're, you're, you're going to have to buy the commodities as a consumer. You'll buy through a broker mm. or a, bull, a bullion dealer. Mm -hmm. So people that buy directly, I think they're going to save, you know, some amount. Yeah. yeah. Uh, whatever their markup is. Very cool. Awesome. Cormac Kinney, thank you so much for joining the Contrarian Investor Podcast today. Fascinating discussion on diamonds. Not something we talk about very often. In fact, we've never talked about it, but we have now. So really thrilled about this. Looking forward to pushing this out to everybody. Obviously, premium subscribers get it first without ads or annoying interruptions. Everybody else is going to have to wait a couple of days. But that's all. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Cormac and all his people for setting this up. And we will see you again next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Contrarian Investor Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. To subscribe to this podcast, simply open your favorite podcast software and search for Contrarian Investor. Follow us on social media by searching for Contrarian Investor on Twitter and Instagram. Send us your thoughts on feedback at contrarianpod.com. We look forward to speaking to you again next time.